start the recording right now and it will be published on the USISA website and the DCG community forum as there were no objections at the time of booking. Okay, so I'm just hoping, yes, I'm, I'm recording. <laughs> I've just seen what you said, John, um, Gareth. Okay, wonderful. So let's move on. So um, today's guest is John Berman, and he's going to be talking about the digital culture at Kingston. And I'm just so excited about this because John has put a lot of work into this and he's provided case studies for us as well. And he's also um, provided answers to submitted questions at the time of booking. So there's about 13 of them and you'll find those questions on the forum. I don't know whether um, Gareth can actually just put that link in there for me um, into the chat. Um, okay, so I'm just going to to move on. All right, so before we do anything else, um, I'm just going to do a little icebreaker. And um, really, it's just to try and find out some information about the topics that you would like to hear more on. So if you just bear with me, I'm just going to change this screen to here we go if I can present my whiteboard and if you I'm hoping that you can see this screen all right and to the right of the screen you'll see you've got some tools now there's a, a tool there which is a tick stamp okay I'd like you all to choose a tick stamp and put your tick in the square that um, has a topic that you would like to hear more on so if you could all do that for me that would be lovely Okay, so a lot of people, ooh, ooh, what happened there? I think somebody's uh, made it a little bit smaller. <laughs> it's gone. Somebody scrolled. Somebody... Okay, all right. So um, I wonder if I could just go back. That didn't work too well, did it? Let's have a look. Um, can't undo. Somebody else just deleted it. All right, so I tell you what, why don't you just put it into the chat for me? All right, so if you go into the chat and just say um, what topics you would like to hear more on from us. And I'm just going to change back to the presentation and then you'll get to see all the different topics. Okay, so Office 365. Okay, that's a very hot topic there. Training approaches. Okay, I know that some people chose um, case studies and things like that. So, this is wonderful. Okay, so did anybody attend our conference about three weeks ago? All right, because... Um, if you did, there were loads of recordings and you'll find those recordings on the USISA website under our group, under that um, conference. And um, there are lots of video recordings and you'll find quite a few case studies there. OK, so. Um, so we do have them available, some available. OK, so thank you very much for that. I'm just going to um, move on because I'm aware of the time. All right, so um, I've just mentioned the conference that we had about three weeks ago, but there are many other group activities. We we do use Twitter. We do the webinars, the 60-minute tech talks. We have a forum, which is the um, the digital capability group community where you can post things up um, and that's where you're going to find the video for this webinar and we also um, we also produce survey results and that leads me on to our next guest okay so we're going to speak to Gillian Gillian are you there I can't hear you, Gillian, so I'm going to see yeah. if... Yeah, yeah, there okay, she you is. Should be able to hear me now. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so welcome, okay. Gillian. Um, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Lorraine. I think I can move the slides along now. We should, no, I need to share them, don't I? You need to take over. Uh, oops, yeah, bear with me. I am just trying to do that on a new laptop, which is proven a little bit challenging, but I should be able to move those. No, yes, fantastic. Okay, uh, I'm Gillian Fielding. I'm an associate lecturer at the University of Salford. 
I lead the Digital Capability Survey project for you, Sizer, uh, which is perhaps I would describe as my hobby, the thing I do in my spare time. I have another full-time job as well, but this is um, this is my passion really, is digital capabilities. Uh, we've launched the survey now for this year, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that, and I've put a link in the chat. Um, the second one, the usizer.ac.uk digcap one, you just need to look in the right-hand menu for the 2017 version because that link also references the 2014 version as well. Just quickly a little bit about the background. Um, the survey complements the long-standing TEL survey, the Technology Enhanced Learning Survey that's widely known about in the uh, sector. But this survey uh, is it focuses on technology enhanced learning. So we felt there was a gap with uh, the professional services staff and the business skills required for academic staff as well. So this is our second version now. The first one was in 2014, we're now on the 2017 version. And we identify developments and trends uh, across the sector, and it enables you to benchmark yourself across other institutions as well. Um, we've had 68 universities complete it this time. There were 63 last time, so thank you for anybody who filled it in. I know it's a big job. And this time we've come up with 36 conclusions and 22 recommendations. And here I've only got five minutes, five to eight minutes, so I'm only going to give you a quick flavour. It's huge. So I'm just going to pull out a few of the findings and the recommendation here to whet your appetites and hopefully uh, encourage you to go and have a look at the rest of the findings. So I'm going to start off with the, the biggest hitting one in my opinion which is a recommendation that comes from section five which is that we want senior leadership within institutions to fully engage with and proactively drive the digital agenda across their institutions um, ideally by appointing an exec member with sole responsibility for this um, this will address some of the barriers uh, and factors that enable the adoption of digital capabilities across institutions. Where we see that executives have done that, we see that there has been more support. Um, the, funded, the, the barriers that people have are often time, funding and resources. So senior executives getting behind it mean that those can be addressed. Okay, another question, one of the questions I'm going to look at from section four is how widely available across an institution were the following for students? And this was, the section four is about accessibility. So this was asking about a, a range of options like an accessible VLE, uh, lectures, notes, class presentations and handouts and recordings. Uh, and a range of other things as well. And what the results found was that um, the results came back and said the most accessible was the VLE, with 84% saying that it was good or widespread availability. Uh, with lecture and uh, class presentations, 74% said it was good and widespread availability. And 32% said that recordings were accessible. Now, to be honest, we found these a little bit surprising and we wondered whether there was a certain amount of overclaiming. And even though we'd specified the definitions, we wondered if people were clear on the definitions and they thought maybe 24-7 availability or different device accessibility, uh, rather than we were talking about cognitive, physical and visual abilities, those sorts of things. And they wondered whether if you've got a modal accessibility block, does that mean you think that your content is accessible because it will not necessarily be the case. So the recommendations, a couple of the recommendations from section four was that we as user either produce some guidance and standard phrases and questions on accessibility which can be included in institutional tender documents for IT, all IT systems. So that's one recommendation. Another was that institutions ensure that staff awareness reinforces the understanding that accessible resources are not just for students with specific needs but they benefit all learners. So that's the point we really want to get across. So a question here from section three, uh, which is about delivery, implementation and practice, is which activities and processes directly encourage staff and support staff's digital capabilities? The top answer was internally provided training in digital capabilities, which I suspect a lot of people on the call were involved with. So I've got 77 people getting back and said that that was a factor. 17% uh, were working towards and one wasn't. Second biggest factor was IT policy and infrastructure enabling innovations, such as software upgrades. 
And the third was the development of pedagogic practice. Now, this might also tie in with the TEF. We found in the findings that TEF had a big influence on driving digital capabilities this time. Um, we also found that HR processes featured quite strongly. There were a lot of other things that featured as well, uh, but too many to list here. And what we found that these often were very similar in student answers as well as the, you know, what makes a difference for students and as well as for staff. definitions that people use across the sector and we looked at how many people were using the GIST definition of digital capabilities and we can see here that 38% are using it right across the sector, 40% are using it in parts of the institution and 22% said that they weren't using it at all. Um, and this builds on last time where we recommended that people use the GIST definition so it enables benchmarking across the sector. That is my tiny little flavour. There's lots and lots of findings in the report. And we've also suggested, our flag here, we suggested this time for areas for further research. Uh, and we've got 16 suggestions. So if you, your students, you know anybody who's interested in doing further research in this area, I'd be very happy to talk to them. I've already had a couple of conversations about that. And there's still a lot more that we could explore as to how we can project, progress this agenda. So I think I've got one minute left for questions. Questions. Does anybody want to ask a question? And whilst you're just thinking, or perhaps putting it in the chat, we have the training forum, we have a hashtag, uh, and the report is the final link. Oh no, oh. Diane's having problems viewing the slides. Okay, what exactly is the problem? Can you not see it at all, or is it not moving? Okay, I think um, Gareth is going to sort that out for us. Thank you so much, Gillian. That's lovely. Oh, that's a whistle stop tour. I know. <laughs> but thank you very much. Um, you've added some more quality to this session. And I'm sure that um, others can, they can contact you or, as, I, as you said, put questions in the chat or in the forum. Um, so thank you very much. And I know you have to rush off. So... Um, you'll be able to Thank see what happens time. watch the video later on <laughs> yeah, all right I look forward to it. thanks bye thank you bye-bye okay so i'm just gonna carry on now just uh take over presenting i'm just wondering is it are lots of people having problems here with the slides hello lorraine can you hear me i can thank you very much um yes uh I just saw the titles like the other users, so I don't know what happened there, whether um, they were appearing in Gillian's view, but not um, um, in the uh, end window. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. Okay, thank you very much. I'll let you know if there's a problem. All right, lovely, thank you. All right, so I'm just gonna flick through her slides. Um, here we go. Okay, so um, we're going to move on now and we're going to speak to John Berman. He's a project manager from Kingston University and he's going to give an overview of the digital culture um, project at Kingston. And he says that he's going to be focusing on digital skills uh, rather than the actual technology. So hello, John. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so over to you. I just need to take out the uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Anyway, my name is John Byrne from Kingston University. Um, at the beginning of my presentation, I have a, a short one minute, 30 second video. So I'll, I'll start that off. Hopefully, you'll be able to see it and hear it. Uh, and then I'll go into the main part of the presentation. Just bear with me while I take over. So, 
I'm getting a message at the bottom saying some people can't see what's been presented or shared. I'm guessing that's possibly people on mobile devices. It could be, yes, or if somebody's called up. Yeah, so they, they can watch the video later. Yes. So let's go on to the first slide. So, videos on the next one, all right? Yes, it is, yes. Right, so, okay. Hopefully it's just going to start. Hello, John. This is Hello. Letty here from uh, York St. John University. It doesn't look as though your video is playing. Oh. It, so, it just moment, finished. It just That's finished, it, yeah. It played all right for me. Oh, all right. Well, I couldn't see it on my view. A few people in the chat are saying it worked fine. It worked fine. I'm uh, funny. I can you apologize. Okay. No problem. Um, if you could, if you later on, if we could have the link in the message in the chat, that'd be fine. I don't know why it's not worked on my browser. Never mind. Like technology, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I know. All right, so anyway, I'll, I'll move on. I'm glad that most people got to see it, and if you didn't, you'll be able to see it in the recording, I hope. And we'll also include a unique link to it, so you will have the opportunity. So moving on, um, Kings University. What are we doing? So we're, we're investigating in a new digital culture project. Uh, and as I've written now, I'm not going to read it word for word, but we want to equip staff and students with the technology. But more importantly, we want to, put, uh, to enhance uh, and deliver digital skills training so we can actually really improve the productivity and the mobility across the, the entire university. Uh, in practical terms, great given the latest technology, but if people don't know how to exploit it, a little bit of a waste. Um, and not just a waste for the technology, a waste for them. This is a golden opportunity for individuals to, to learn and get something out of it. Um, moving on. So how are we going to do that? Well, we will, and I'm going to explain all these bullet points in a little bit more detail. So we're going to upgrade the underlying technical platforms. Um, we will provide high quality um, digital skills training using a variety of formats. And we will engage a number of digital champions you could put in brackets, actually change agents, but we, we've entitled them digital champions because that's what they're about. So each step in, in a little bit more detail. This is probably the last slide where I will talk technical. Um, if there are any questions, post them. I'm a little bit technical, but not overly. So the underlying platform, Mac, it will be based on the new Sierra release. It will include Skype for Business, Office 365, and Box, which is our storage solution. And that's for all Kingston University owned Mac devices. PC side of life, it's very similar. It will be based on the Windows 10 platform, again with Skype for Business, Office 365, and Box for everybody. Um, we also have a BDI platform for a desktop anywhere offering, which is currently based around the Windows 7 platform. This is in the process of being upgrading, excuse me, upgraded. Um, and that will be based around the Windows 10 platform. So uh, investing a lot of time and energy and money in the underlying technology, 
which will stand us in good stead and have a nice standard platform. Um, and that's probably all I'm going to say about technology, I'm afraid. So, digital skills training. This is where it all comes together, really. Um, we undertook some digital skills surveys earlier in the year of all staff and students and had quite a reasonable return for a survey. Um, and we got clear messages from it. As an example, um, staff overwhelmingly prefer formal style training. They'd like to go into a classroom and, and actually go through training in a formal way. Students, not surprisingly, overwhelmingly prefer the informal option. They just want to be, literally be able to pop in, um, get some training, get some help on what they're interested in and, and walk away. So th those two top mediums we will provide. I will provide those throughout the lifetime of the project. Um, in addition to that, we will also provide online training, which is quite key, and one-to-one -one training, where appropriate. We obviously can't do one-to-one -one, one -to -one for everybody, but where it's required, we will do it. Now, I'm just going to look to the next slide. Yes, just make sure I get it in the right order. Um, the online material, um, it'll all be themed, and actually, the, the, sorry, the, the Face to face material. It's all theme based. So none of it will be about how do I create a macro in Excel because that's online, that information. How to do something in Word, it's online. So it's all about the theme. And I've listed some of the key themes there. So how do I attend meetings with my colleagues if we're not in the same location? Okay, underlying technology is there, you can't get away from that. But the training is theme based, um, which is a more attractive way to do it. As I say, we're not, we don't want to do individual applications. Um, so you can see some of our common theme-based training there, how do I present dynamic and interactive content? Uh, how do I collaborate with others from my mobile device? Um, and all of our material will be in Canvas, which is RBLE. So it doesn't matter whether you're a staff or a student, you go into Canvas, and one of the core modules there is called Digital Skills. And that's where everyone will go. Over time, the material that's, that's currently based around our intranet will be migrated to Canvas. So at a point in the future, all training, uh, IT-related training material will be in Canvas, which makes it easier to manage, central point, and nobody is unsure where to go. Uh, and that's a bit what it looks like. I just did a screenshot of what it currently looks like. So you can, I don't, I assume you can see my mouse. Um, so you, everyone gets access to this digital culture logo here. Once they click on the digital culture logo, then they will see, it's a little bit smaller, literally, but they'll see these, these theme-based training things. So there, where do I store my documents and work collaboratively with my colleagues, for instance. And there are a whole range of these. They're all set out in a fairly standard template, so they're easy to um, edit and update, not hard to maintain at all. Moving on. So, digital skill training. So, one of the questions I believe was about how we get engagement, uh, and this actually goes a little way to explaining how we get the engagement. So for staff, we're going to link training modules for new staff who join as part of their probation. Um, get a new member of staff into the organisation. It's actually not unreasonable for us to provide training for them, how to use some of the core systems, or how to collaborate, how to be mobile. So we will provide that. Um, and then for, for existing staff and ongoing staff, we're going to link some of the training modules that are based in Canvas to annual staff objectives, which is quite, I think it shows a, it shows a clear commitment on the part, behalf, you know, on the part of the organisation that we're serious about training, because we're going to provide it, it will be there. So that's a good thing to do. Um, possibly staff might think, oh, it's another thing to do. Um, hopefully not. Um, but it also gives them the opportunity to, to learn things because all, of course, all of these things are transferable. So in the event a member of staff was to leave Kingston University, the digital skills they learn here, they can use elsewhere. So it's not all about the university. Some of it is about the individual as well. Um, for students, um, we are going to link our training modules um, to the Kingston Award Scheme for students. So these are things that Kingston Award Scheme, I'm sure you will have your own versions of. These are, th these are things that students can apply for and do outside of their academic um, formal timetable, and they get points for it. Um, students like points, so linking training modules to Kingston Award Scheme gives them the opportunity to get points, and probably without even realizing, to enhance their digital skills. And again, these are transferable. 
it's key that, that we give this. Um, and I obviously have questions, but I'm trying to ignore them because I believe I'll be interrupted at some point to answer them. So I will focus on, on, on talking about what we're doing. So that's how we're going to encourage staff to move forward. Um, and it will be received reasonably well by most. A lot of this is about changing staff behaviour, which, as we all know, it can be difficult because people are used to doing things in a particular way. Uh, it works, no one will dispute that. So getting people to change the way they work it is a challenge, but one that we can meet and one we can move forward from, I believe. Uh, we're then going to make use of digital champions. So we've recruited digital champions from the staff uh, across our directorate, our directorate, excuse me, and our faculties and students. Uh, and a digital champion has a, a number of roles. So we see them as being ambassadors really for the digital culture project within their, within their own areas. So we, we look to them to promote uh, and say good things about us. Um, we look for them to communicate the key messages that we want to get across. We have lots of communication channels, but ultimately uh, the best way of communicating is, is mouth to mouth and, and it works really well. So we, we would look to them, or we are already looking to them to advertise um, training courses we may be running. Uh, and as we get further into actually the full-scale deployment of the technology, we will, look, we will work with our, our digital champions, particularly on the star side, to help with the scheduling aspect, because um, a directorate knows best when it's, it's a good time to, to deploy them. Um, and I put there, and it's, it is true, the role is to champion the project and inspire staff and students to help them develop their digital skills, which are key both to the organisation and for the individuals when they move on. You can't go anywhere without having some level of digital skills. You need them wherever you go. Um, and I put at the bottom again, technical. I, I do keep away from technical. Um, it's not a technical role, and we've got a really good gender balance here. I think perhaps in the past, when we would have advertised these roles as technical, it would have been a, seen a little bit like sort of a techie thing for the boys. Not a case here at all. We have a, an excellent gender balance, and it's open to all. And we, to actually encourage um, females to, to actually apply for these roles. Because this is about training, uh, influencing and encouraging, not about techie stuff, which whilst it does support it, will just work. Uh, and the last thing I'll put there at the bottom is staff, uh, when we advertise for this, through the directors, through the formal channels, we did clearly ask for volunteers, not for people to be volunteered. Um, I have contacted all the volunteers from the, from the staff and asked them, and they are all volunteers. They all want to do it. So I think, again, that's um, a real plus. Excuse me. Hopefully, I'm not going too fast. It's easy to get carried away when you're almost talking to yourself, if you know what I mean. Right, moving on. So You're doing well, John. A... You're doing well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so here's just a bit of a... a, a I think why we should use online meeting, for instance. So we're, we're multi-site, as I'm sure many of you are, um, and here. So on average, one member of staff spends 12 hours walking between sites for meetings. Um, I'm not going to read it down and down and down, but so 142, based on 100 staff, that's 142 marathons we do. You could argue that's good, we're all extremely fit, but it is 1,200 hours of non-productive time, and the 100 is a very conservative estimate. So we, we spend a lot of time walking between sites. We, we invest some time and energy in showing people how to collaborate across sites using the tools provided. And um, things could be a lot better for staff all round. Nobody likes walking between sites in the winter. It's not a pleasant thing to do. Um, but it's an example of where providing the, the training, providing the technology can actually make someone's life easier, I believe. And I, I, I do truly believe it will make people's lives easier, no doubt about it. And part of our project, we are we do already practice what we preach. So um, traditional project boards now move to Skype-based project boards. We don't need to be in the same place. We did the first time to meet, and that's fine. Post that, we can just move on. And this is slide 26. I, I can't remember what slide 27, 28, and 29 are. Um, I don't know if Lorraine can. Maybe I'll just press the button and see what's next. 
I thought I'd just about finished. Yeah, they're most likely my slides, um, Are they? John. Yes. Did I not press the button? Go I'll ahead. press it and then go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're all arranged. I do apologize. <laughs> I should have written down how many slides. Um, so that, that's an overview of what we're, what we're looking at doing. Um, in Thanks, John. Terms, yeah, I'm, I'm coming in now. It's um, Nettie, or okay. also known as Annette. So just to, I've just been looking at some of the questions in the chat. There's quite a few coming through. Um, so. So mainly, that one of the first questions was from Susan. Um, she realised that the face-to-face -face training uh, was much preferred by your staff when you um, surveyed them. Okay. So um, was there a difference between support services and academic staff and what their preference was? Or did they all just want to, want Actually, to have the formal? Overall, all staff, including academic staff, prefer the more formal, traditional style of training. Now, possibly, I, I'm only suggesting, because we didn't ask ages on the, on the survey, maybe it's, it's an age-related thing. I don't mm. know. Interesting. I think, yeah, well, I've done a bit of research on this, and I think I, I think you can't beat human interaction with technology, but that's a bit of one of my um, things, to be honest. But anyway, <laughs> here we are. Have, we are humans. We are interacting. Yeah, so. Staff could have opted to be the more informal, drop in, get help. Yeah. And, you know, right. But they didn't. They prefer the traditional. And I do wonder if that's perhaps a, an age bracket yeah, thing. I, I don't know. Bracket. Yeah, interesting. So, how many training staff have you got? You say you've got, you've got um. Not many. Did say that again. Not many. So we have um, for the put during the life life cycle of the project, which um, com completes in July 2018, we have a training manager who's defined, who led this, who created the strategy, created the skills survey. Uh, to get us to the point where we know what we need to deliver. Uh, we're actually using our digital champion students, once they're trained, to deliver the training. And we've got about 22, 23 of those at the minute. Wow. Uh, and we think it's obviously the academic studies, but uh, we get a number of hours per week with the student. And we think it's excellent that students gives them a skill that they, they can, you know, they can train and a skill they can move on with. It's also for good for them to train staff and their peers as well, and it's well received so far. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, so I'm just going working through the questions. So how Sandy asked, how did you decide on who gets what type of training? So did they just opt in to, um, you know, like the face to face? Uh, did the so staff? We did the survey. Right. And the survey gave us a clear indication of, of what people would prefer. So initially, in our, in our early stages, so last month in the yeah, month of May and the month of June, uh, we're running um, we run two or three week, two or three classroom-based training sessions per week um, across the campuses, uh, just to see what uptake is like. And despite the fact that students have a lot of drop-in, the students who are around, there's still quite a few around, are turning up for those. Um, so it's choice. What we do is we're, we're going to we're already providing fixed classroom-based training on a number of topics, mostly around what's new in Windows 10, what's new in Office 365, um, something about uh, creating collaborative pre presentations and so on. Um, and as we move further forward, we will then start to have more informal drop-in um, training available, and we will advertise that as well. Right. It's coming up to summer, so whilst there are still a lot of people around, a lot of, as you probably appreciate, a lot of academics are now about to go up on holiday. Not all the students, but a lot of the students disappear. So we will be gearing up over the next couple of months for really September, when we're very busy again, to provide formal um, training in the classroom and informal. Right. And you, you mentioned the 22 digital champions. Do you actually pay them for their you services? Do. You do? The students. So how do we incentivize them? We pay them. But yeah. uh, yes, they get paid for it. But you can you can tell very quickly whether somebody's just there to get the money, whether they're actually interested in what they're doing. For their experience as well. And I'm not being naive. Some of them are really enjoying it. Yeah, oh, that's good. And actually, so, the ones that don't, they drop off. They don't turn up. Yeah, even if they're getting paid. Yeah, it's not, paid, they don't bother yeah, after a week. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, did you do? Alistair's asked, did you do the training before or after rolling out the technology? Ah, I was, yeah, we haven't actually. We haven't actually rolled out the technology yet. We're about to start. Okay. We've done some early adopters. We've got some uh, machines around um, with students and with staff, so they can have a look at it. In many ways, the technology—they're on Windows 7 really at the minute. 
and they've got link, they've got all the other tools, they've got Office 365, although some of them don't realize it or they've got access to it. So in many ways, the technology is not that new to them. Okay. Actually. It might look a bit different with the Windows menu system. They might have to be helped a little bit initially, as in, oh, where do I find something? But actually, in many ways, the technology is not that different. We're consolidating it and making it a standard. Um, the big thing is exploitation of the technology, which is why I don't talk much about the techie stuff. And the technical people would hate me because I just say, well, it's, that's actually quite easy. You just know it's going to work. Yeah, yeah. Getting people to exploit it, that's the challenge. Okay. So um, how do you ensure, I'm switching between these questions because right. we're still talking about the digital champions, really. Um, do, how do you ensure that the digital champion students have the necessary training skills? So do you provide training for them, like train the provide, trainer? I suppose it's train, training for the trainers, yes. Yes. Um, okay. And then train for the trainers, then we let them loose, for want of a better phrase, and, and we're with them um, mm. and help them. And then once we feel confident, we just let them go. Right. And actually, they pick it up pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and what can you give me some examples of the sort of sessions that are being delivered? So are they on the themes? We, we're delivering sessions on what's new in Windows 10, and that's a what's new from a Kingston University perspective. Yeah. So the new menu system where you're going to find stuff. Um, the nice little features about uh, virtual screens. And so what's new in Windows 10? What's new in Office 365? Oh, sorry, Office 365. A lot of staff and students don't realize, as part of the license agreement, they can use Office 365. Some mm -hmm. do, some don't. So a bit about Office 365 and the key components. A uh, little bit about one called, I can't remember its exact name, but Presentations. And actually, that's really an introduction to Sway, which um, is another presentation tool. Yeah. We do something on Forms, which has been really successful, which I'll come back to in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and we do... Uh, quite a large piece about Box, which is our storage solution. We don't use OneDrive, we use a solution called Box. Very similar, and we talk a lot about that. And all those training courses are well subscribed. People people seem to enjoy them. Uh, and the most successful one, possibly, Forms, Microsoft Forms. Really? Probably like a lot of the people listening, uh, surveys all the time. Uh, and a lot of people here use um, SurveyMonkey, for instance. Mm. Uh, forms are accessible to anybody in the organization and you don't need to survey monk anymore you can, you can do it yourself it's dynamic it's creative uh, and a case study that which we will publish in a week or two is where a particular department i won't mention them uh, they would send out a, a word document to several hundred people asking about an event they're going to turn up to they get the replies transcribe all that onto a spreadsheet so you can imagine the workload yeah yeah. Showed them how to do forms. They sent it out in one mail shot, and the results are dynamic. Okay. So, um, why? One of the a couple of questions here is why? Why have you preferred to use Box as your cloud uh, drive in favour of OneDrive? That's a very good question, to which I can't give you a complete answer at this stage, but I will answer any questions purely because it was here before I arrived. Clearly, because what? Say that again. A box is here before I arrived. All so, right. Uh, so I will, I will answer. So it's been inherited. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll, but I'll, it'll have to be in the questions. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Um, how do staff feel about being trained by students? Actually, once the staff that are, are into training like it. I think it's funny, isn't it? Mm. I think they probably careful I'll say this in case there's any trainers listening. I think they probably feel that the students are potentially a little bit more dynamic, dare I say. Right, okay, interesting. Um, They've obviously not been trained by me then. <laughs> we, we've not had all benefits. I think training can be I mean some of these subjects if the training is not done correctly, and I'm sure you're not like this, they can be a bit dry, can't they? <laughs> yeah, I know ex exactly what you mean. And, and students, providing they get the content across we're pretty relaxed about how they deliver it. Yeah. They've got pretty much a free hand. If yeah. they want to be creative in delivering it, pro provide the key messages to get across, that's what's important to us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, going back to the forms that you mentioned. Um, yeah. The answer the is yes, it does do branching. I saw the question. Yeah, does it do branching? It does branching. It's actually very good. 
It does branching. It does all the traditional things that survey monkey will do. It, it, it'll work on any platform, any mobile device. You can share the link with people inside or outside the organization. Um, it's got a lot of features, and I assume that Microsoft will develop it over time. The key thing is the results are dynamic, instantly back in graphic form, which you can then export to a spreadsheet. Right, it, okay. It is actually a really good tool. I'm so determined just... to make sure nobody in this organization uses anything but forms because there's no need to. Okay, interesting. I'm going to look into that a bit further. Um, so, Chris Parry's asked, are you training how to continually adopt new technology or training on how to use the technology? Now, you mentioned the themes uh, earlier on in the presentation. So, it was more like um, task-based, is it? Or is it... It is. It is, uh, is it task-based? It's a fair comment. I mean, we take Skype for business which is the underlying technology. We want people, to, we want to encourage people to, to, to move around less from site to site, because it's just impractical, and they waste a lot of time doing it. And start, therefore start to use more, more collaborative ways of talking. So for instance, Skype conferencing. You don't necessarily need to, um, to use every aspect of it, but to start doing Skype conferencing. So that's a good an introduction. But what we would like then to do is, is and it is difficult, and encourage staff to perhaps think a little bit more, right, how could I now use this? Now I know the basics. How yeah. can I take it to the next level? So for instance, you know, Skype, Skype conference is a great tool. Uh, they can start to bring third parties in. So some staff are very confident and they know what they're doing. Some staff, it's not that they're not confident, they've never been shown. And so yeah. they see the technology and get a bit worried and it shouldn't be like that. Um, it should be second nature to them. So we will show them and we will encourage them and we will give them all the information and help they need. Uh, and it will evolve over time. It won't happen overnight. I'd be naive if I said it would, but it will evolve over time. Okay. You might notice that the slides are moving. I think I'm hoping somebody is bringing up a slide that Sarah has asked for. Yeah, I, I haven't touched to... anything. No, I think it's some one of the other oh. presenters. Okay. Um, Sorry, it was Oops. me. Um, <laughs> I'm fine. just wondering whether, Sarah, is this a slide that you wanted? Oh, no, she says. <laughs> when to stop. <laughs> so it's how to... The website. The website. Right. Oh, that one. This it's one? Filled. Yeah, okay. Brilliant, okay. Um, I'm just seeing if there's anything that I've missed out. Um, so we'll mention you... KPIs, I think. Yes. Um, so, yes, can you elaborate on KPIs? Yeah, so one, one thing we're doing for KPIs, which is our initial way of measuring it, is, uh, and I, I use simple examples just because I can. So for instance, um, sway training and form training. So we give sway training, can you imagine in the month of May, we give sway training to 100 people. Using the Office uh, 365 adoption reporting tools, you can see the uptake of sway usage. So you would expect reasonably that uh, if the more sway training you give, if people are interested, obviously, uh, you would expect an increase in the adoption of sway. Um, box, our, our storage solution. You would expect the more box training you give to see an increase in the usage of box. So we'll track it like that over time initially. Right. Uh, because it's, it's a practical way to track it. Um, you might then see that actually you get an initial surge of sway usage or forms usage, and then it drops off, in which case you'll question is it not doing the job for us, or is, it, is the training not very good? Right. Uh, that, that's the way we will start. And then probably log that against, for instance, the number of people in the department and the number of people that have attended training as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon's asked, did you use any form of consultancy resource to support the project? Uh, what, from the training perspective? I think so. She's saying, for example, architecture, design, development, testing, implementation. So we, we have the techie bit, of, of which we have our, our normal technical resources, um, and we've supplemented those with some individuals for the additional work though, for, for the Windows 10 platform and Mac and so on and so forth, um, if that's what you meant. But on the yeah. digital skills side, really, we, we employed a very good trainer who's very knowledgeable in thinking a little bit out of the box, being a, being a bit of a level above a hands-on trainer, but someone who's worked within the training environment for a number of years. But I'm not sure that that really answered your question. 
sorry. Yeah, I think Sharon, if you could elaborate on that, please, I'll in the best. messenger. <laughs> okay. So I think that's ma mainly most of the questions covered. Um, I mean, can you, I just you ask you, Nettie, did you, yeah. did you cover how have you mapped your staff digital capabilities? Oh, no, that, that's a good one, actually, because that's um, a big, um, big thing in our area anyway, but yes. Yeah, and also, just one more, how do you link training modules to annual staff objectives? Right, okay, that's, they sound good. Okay, so, John, if you're still there, you've disappeared from my screen. Hello. <laughs> so. Still here. So you can as well ask the questions you just heard in the background. I can still so, hear you. There you go. You pop back up. So, right. um, how how do you map the um, the things you, the, the skills that you train on to the digital capabilities framework, if at all? I suppose, if I'm honest, loosely, uh, part of our digital skills survey, which was quite comprehensive, asked a lot of questions with, around. Um, device usage for home or at work, what do you use your device for at home, for instance, internet, shopping, banking, uh, do you do work at home as well? Um, we asked about, in addition to how you'd like to be trained, what types of, of things uh, would you feel that you would need to be trained upon? So do you need training on how to use the internet? Would you need training on how to use Excel? So all those sorts of questions really, which gave us a a general sort of, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it, it gave us a general baseline of staff and student digital skill levels. Um, and obviously it's an average because everyone's different. But if you were score, and I can't remember what the skill levels are, but if you're scoring out of 10, with 10 being the top of the tree, so to speak, and one, you know, you would, you, you would look at our staff and say that we were probably, I don't know, listening to this, <laughs> you would probably say, Overall, they're probably a bit sort of a four to a five. Right. Um, and you can look at the areas then of the, so through the survey, look at the areas where they're perhaps weaker. Um, and those are the areas that you can then focus on. Uh, and then you can compare with students. And as you can probably imagine, there is a marked difference between student skills and uh, staff skills. Students excel in the internet and anything outside of the, of the organization. Staff. Excel internally, but not so well externally. If that makes it, does, it, does that make sense? Yes, I think it does. Yes. Because staff come to work every day, they use the system, don't know how to use it, and they don't exploit it as much as they could. Um, well, I think, well, I, in my experience, a lot of um, staff have inherited Excel spreadsheets, yeah. so they know how to, um, you know, input data and so on. But they might not necessarily have the deeper knowledge about creating from scratch. Yes, and. A lot of staff are actually, you know, competent at work. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. They struggle a bit when they go home with a machine, not sure they could perhaps trust a site, for instance. Yeah. My details in there, uh, and these are all things that we all we all need to know, uh, and we need to, to sort of spread the word and, and tell these t tell people. Yeah. No shame in not knowing, is there? No, exactly. Well, true, and and. I'd be interested to see a copy of your survey um, that you that you originally sent out. We can you know, share the, questioning. the survey is anonymised, so it has no names in it. So yeah, you know um, why I can't share it. Yeah, I think more it. the question types. It's just sort of getting that, you know, yes. um, without having a, a massive list of questions about um, tasks <laughs> within Excel. You know, how would you? How did you find out exactly what they wanted to know from it? I think there are about forty. 40 questions actually. Right, okay. It was quite a big comprehensive survey and off the top of my head, the staff, so we've got about two and a half thousand staff, something like that, and it's, uh, I can't remember, at the end I think it's 16 or 17 percent return, which I think for a survey is quite good. Yeah, definitely. Well, if you could share that with us, that'd be fantastic. Just I will the check questions. first, so yeah. no one has any objections, and then assume yeah. they don't. Then yes, Just the questions will. really, not the, day, not the results, but yeah, oh, that'd right. be okay. useful. Okay, I can share the questions, not a problem. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, does does Canvas integrate with Office 365? I should know, shouldn't I? Mm, maybe, I yeah. I no idea. <laughs> Depends what you mean by, by does it integrate. Hmm. If you click on an, an email link within Canvas, it's going to open up the client, which, depending upon what you've got your preferences are, will open up the pro client. I'm not sure what you mean by 
integrate. Oh, that was a question from Sarah. So Sarah could maybe, uh, well, Brian has answered, yes, it does. So that's you. Is Brian from your institution, John? Or Brian you knows anyway? Know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but it does. Okay. Of course it does. <laughs> Um, now, linking to um, staff objectives, we call them PDRs at York St. John, know, yeah. but um, you, you mentioned earlier about having um, training as part of um, a staff member's probation or um, yes. when they first join. What about the yearly objectives? Do you use that at all? We, we, are, we are working with our HR colleagues to incorporate that. So. For instance, my, one of my yearly objectives could be to attend uh, the course entitled, I'm just looking at the screen, how do I attend meetings with my colleagues if they're not in the same location? Yes. Uh, my, you know, my line manager might, and I might contribute, I'm going to do that course. And as you, I don't know if you're familiar with Canvas, but it will record that I've gone in and done that course and completed it. Right. Uh, okay, and, and it's not onerous. It helps, it helps everybody. And it's a good thing to do. Right. And I, I do believe the fact that you're putting into annual objectives demonstrates that your organisation is serious about supporting digital skills. Yeah. That, that, bother. Well, yeah, true. That, so that's proving that sort of management are on board and wanting to, um, you know, encourage staff to Absolutely. to improve their skills. I mean, there's always room for improvement, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I know staff are busy and you've got lots of other things to do. And this is one of many things that, that gets put upon them. but. If they, screwed, if they improve their digital skills without even realising it, they will make their own actual jobs a little bit easier. Yeah, and, and that's interesting without realising it, because I'm, you know, I'm a great believer of bringing digital skills into every day. It's, you know, yeah. you, no one wants to go to a session and say, oh, right, we're going to do digital stuff today. I think, yeah. it, you know, it needs to be more practical than that. And, that's, um, why and our, that's why our training, we're trying to make it theme-based and not yes, sort of techie. Yes, definitely. Because it just doesn't work. Turn, talk techie for training, it turns people off. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've covered most of the questions, uh, unless Lorraine can see anything um, that I've missed out on. Um, so if we move on to. Um, can I, back can to I Lorraine. Ask question? Very much, yeah. Nettie. Sorry, John, what were you saying? Can I just ask Julian Dobson's question? Yeah, go ahead. Just because it is relevant, HR, oh, no appetite, I tried to pour, I hope there's no HR people listening. Um, we got an HR person to be on our project board and we didn't let them out of the room until they agreed to, as part of the project scope, that we would get it included. Um, so it was a bit forceful, possibly, uh, but it seemed to have worked. Oh, I hope that helps, Julian. I think sometimes you, you do just have to say this needs to be done. Oh, thank you so much, John. That's just a wonderful experience that you're sharing with everyone. And, um, you know, there are more questions that have been asked and they're actually on the forum. Um, there were about 13 and this is one of them. Um, you've got Eileen Kennedy, who's a learning technology projects officer from UCL. And she said that she was interested in the use of MS Teams. And are you using it? Are you planning on using it? And how? And I know that what you've done for us is that you've included a case study um, in this online um, chat room or this online um, room at the moment. So if anybody wants to download the case study that John has, we've got it attached to this meeting room. You've got the third, um, you've got the presentation button. If you click on that and then you'll see it says manage attachments. There's only one. And then what you'll be able to do is um, to download it. OK, so um, please feel free to do that. And I can see that Gareth has actually um, put in the chat the link for um, where the other questions are. OK, so you've got that to have a look at as well. Um, yep. Oh, and he's got a link for the case study, which is fantastic. OK, so um, this has been really good. Um, has anybody got any more questions? We're, we've got five more minutes. And so um, I don't know whether we missed anything out in the chat previously, because I think there's loads of questions being asked right at the beginning. Um, Nettie, have you gone through and found anything else that maybe you haven't mentioned? Uh, I'm just working my way through. Um, 
I think we're just about cover most of it um i think sharon's um question about um did you use any form of consultancy contract resource she did admit, admit it was a techie a techie question um so i don't know whether that that might be better for her to speak to john uh, via email yeah, drop me a line i mean if anyone's got a burning question that drop me a line or or I'm sure Lorraine will show me how to answer the questions that are on the forum. Excuse yeah, me. brilliant. Actually, I'll um, put the answers there anyway, but if there are more questions that you want to add, then we can do that. Um, there was one thing. I can remember having a chat with you, John, before you know, before inviting you to come and um, yeah. share your um, experience. And you talked about um, Microsoft uh, Classroom, some, some classroom. Can you just, oh, do you remember? No. Yeah, so... I assume it applies to us at all. If you've got your working with your account manager, we, we organised to set up some Microsoft showcase showcase classroom events for our digital champions. So effectively, we've taken all our digital champions, well actually split them into two halves, took them off to Microsoft in um, Waterloo for the day, and they got dedicated training on the Microsoft Office Microsoft Office products that we use in our organisation. Um, and for our champions, that was really really useful thing to do because it actually showed them and you sit down there they've got a nice big surface hub they throw out lots of uh, lots of techie devices and let the students uh sorry the digital champions which is students and staff have a look at them but they learn they learn the key products from the set um and then they encourage the staff and the students in this instance to sign up to the microsoft mm -hmm. educating community Idea. I don't know where that music came from. <laughs> anyway, so Microsoft Educator, Microsoft Educator. Maybe staff won't be quite as interested in it, but it is a good thing to do. You can learn a lot. Students love it because it's global. Once you, you're a member and you get your badges and your points, you can take them anywhere in the world. Okay. I really would push that. It's a good thing to do. Uh, and you can learn a lot. How would they how would they go about if they were interested in doing that, who would they contact? Is it well, would the they just contact their Microsoft account? Yes, contact your Microsoft account manager for the, the showcase classroom. Um, uh, and if you haven't got the time or, or whatever, you can still um, just Google Microsoft Educator. You can sign up with your Office 365 account. Okay, wonderful. Okay, now, um, thank you so much, John. This has been thank lovely. You. Really have appreciated you taking the time out to do this. And um, as I say, you know, the recording of this, webinar or this 60 minute tech talk will be on the forum um, but we are also looking we're always looking should I say um, for people to volunteer and um, so if any of you out there have any experiences that you would like to share with the rest of the community then please just contact me lbarclay at sgul.ac.uk um, you you know it doesn't have to be this year um, it could be a joint presentation with another um, institution if you want um, just let me know um, because we need to keep this community alive and it's so it's the only way to do that is to share our experiences and um, best practices and I'm just going to quickly go back to the slide before and just say that after this webinar what will happen is you CISA um, they will actually send out um, an email with a um, link to feedback for this webinar so if you could actually fill that in for us, that would be really nice. So we'd like to say thank you very much for coming, everybody. And um, we look forward to seeing you again or, you know, being with you again at the next 60 Minute Tech Talk. Thank you very much, um, Gareth and Nettie, too. And also Gillian, if you're listening again. Um, thank you very much. OK, goodbye, everyone. Okay, bye.